I am Darius, the great king, the king of kings, the king in Persia, the king of countries, the son of Hastaspes, grandson of Arsames, the Achaemenid. The first line of the Byzantine inscription, commissioned by Darius I, king of Persia. Hello, I'm Mark Selig, and welcome back to Casting Through Ancient Greece, episode 13, Persia, king of kings. The old empires of the Hittites, Assyrians, Babylonians, and Lydians were now in the past. Their lands had now been incorporated into something much larger. What began as a relatively small group of Iranian peoples were able to challenge and dominate the power in the Zagros Mountains. From there, their influence spread in all directions. A new empire had been founded and grew in the space of only 29 years to become the largest the region had seen before. Last episode, we ended with the death of its founder, Cyrus the Great. He is thought to have been killed trying to further extend and shore up the empire's boundaries. It isn't known for sure where and how Cyrus died, but our Greek sources place him somewhere in the northeast of his empire. Herodotus says he knows a number of versions, but only relates what he sees as being the most plausible. He has Cyrus campaigning against the Scythian tribe, northeast of his empire, which were ruled by a queen named Tamaris. This is where Herodotus gives his Greek audience a tale in hubris in Cyrus's relentless pursuit of extending his empire. Even Croesus, now in Persian service, makes an appearance in his account, warning Cyrus of campaigning into their lands. After initial victories and the capture of Queen Tomyris' son, the queen threatened Cyrus, I swear by the son, our master, to give you more blood than you can drink, for all your gluttony. Final battle was fought that saw the Persians defeated and where Cyrus fell. Once his body was recovered by the Scythians from the field of battle, Queen Tomyris, after pushing his head into a skin full of human blood, cried out, Though I have conquered you and live, Yet you have ruined me treacherously by taking my son. I fulfil my threat. You have your fill of blood. In general terms, it seems plausible that Cyrus fell somewhere away from the Greek world periphery. Or else we probably would have more information about his death. Although it is likely Herodotus is recounting a story he had been told of Cyrus's death. It would seem he is retelling it with his Greek audience in mind. Now that the founder, Cyrus the Great, had died, Continuity and legitimacy would be needed to ensure the empire would survive intact. Today we are going to continue our look at the rise of the Persian Empire and focus on the next two rulers, Cambyses and Darius. This will then take us up to what the Greeks saw as the great showdown between the East and the West, where the roots had existed in stories of the mythological past. But it was now to explode into their lives, and for the first time a written account of the struggle would be recorded and survive into our times. On the news of Cyrus the Great's death, a new ruler needed to take his place and continue the momentum of this great new empire. It was essential that the transition of power would take place as smoothly as possible, as this was the time that subjugated populations would revolt. Any perceived weakness in the ruling class would just increase the likelihood of revolts taking place. It seems that Cyrus had planned his succession, and from his two sons, his son Cambyses, had been prepared to take the Persian throne when his time came. Some have even suggested that he had taken part in official ruling duties with his father in 538 BC, as some tablets refer to him as King of Babylon, while also referring to Cyrus as King of the Lands. This reference though only appears in tablets for this year and doesn't reappear again, so most historians are unsure what to make of it since there is nothing else in the historical record to judge it against. Nevertheless, Cambyses in 530 BC came to inherit the largest empire the world had yet known. He commanded many different peoples, though they had been allowed by Cyrus to worship their own gods and run their own local affairs, mostly as they saw fit. In return, the subjugated peoples were expected to provide tribute to the empire and also provide troops when the need arose. This policy saw that large uprisings were less likely to take place, as ordinary people who did not have their personal lives interfered with would be less willing to rise up and risk their own lives. Though, even with this policy, cities would try and revolt from Persian rule, and in these cases, Cyrus's response had been swift and harsh to set an example. One of Cambyses' first actions as ruler, to have his father's body return to Pasargadae, the city Cyrus had built and made the capital of his empire. Today, just outside the ancient site, the tomb of Cyrus the Great can still be visited and is protected as a heritage listing. 
The next order of business for Cambyses was focusing on the campaign against Egypt, which was probably in the planning stages in the last years of Cyrus's rule. In 525 BC, Cambyses launched his Egyptian campaign, which much planning had gone into in its lead up. During the planning, Cambyses had received aid from Polycrates, the tyrant of the Greek island of Samos, just off the Ionian coast. This was the same Polycrates that we saw Sparta launch their failed campaign on a couple of years later, when we did our episode on Sparta. Samos and Egypt had been allies, but it appears a falling out had taken place, though we are unsure why. Polycrates may have seen Persia as being the more powerful of the two, and wanted to be favoured by the new empire. Though a tale known as Polycrates' Ring is recounted by Herodotus, that was seen to explain the breakdown of the Samnian Egyptian alliance. Polycrates was considered a very lucky man. His luck made his ally and friend, Amasis, the previous pharaoh of Egypt, very nervous, as the gods would certainly become jealous. It would be inevitable that misfortune would soon catch up with Polycrates. Amasis suggested a way to prevent the danger to his continued luck. He told Polycrates to take something that he valued above all else and throw it away, never to be seen again. Polycrates ended up deciding on a signet ring he was extremely fond of and sailed out into the sea, tossing it overboard. Nearly a week later, a fisherman back from a day's work found he had caught a large fish that he thought would make a perfect gift for Polycrates. Polycrates accepted the gift and had his servants prepare it. In the stomach of the fish, they found a signet ring and they returned it to him. Polycrates then wrote to Amasis, telling him of what had happened after following his advice. He received a reply saying, How impossible it is for one man to save another from his destiny, and how certain it was that Polycrates, whose luck held even to the point of finding again what he deliberately threw away, would not end well. With this, he then informed Polycrates that the pact they had was no longer in effect, the rationale being that Amasis would save himself the distress once calamity struck, since they would no longer be friends. An entertaining tale, but surely there was more to the breakdown of their alliance. Anyway, back to Cambyses' campaign in Egypt. More assistance was gained from the Arabs, who Cambyses engaged in foreign relations. Their cooperation was essential as they controlled the passage across the Sinai Peninsula. Having now secured allies and safe passage for the army, Cambyses now launched his Egyptian campaign. The Persians first encountered the Egyptian army east of the Nile Delta, where in the ensuing battle, they put the Egyptians to flight. The Persians were then able to march into the Nile Valley and place Memphis, the capital, under siege. In conjunction with the navy, the Persian army was able to breach the walls and capture the city, and the king, Semeticus, had only become king some six months earlier. We hear from Herodotus that the Persian policy of treating conquered rulers well was also extended to Semeticus, but sometime after Egypt's fall to the Persians, it was found that the old Egyptian king had been behind the planning of a revolt so Cambyses had him executed. With Egypt now captured, Cambyses' attention then turned west to Libya and south to Ethiopia. Herodotus tells us that after the conquest of Egypt, the Libyans offered Cambyses tribute, which apparently was accepted, though the amount some cities offered was considered unsatisfactory. One of these cities was that of Cyrene, which had started out as a Greek colony back in the 6th century BC established by Battus and his fellow colonists from Thera, which we spoke about earlier in the series. It seems that the Persians took this coastal city, but then planned to march deeper into Libya, where things started to devolve for the Persian army. Both the campaigns, west and south, come down to us as colossal failures, with some colourful tales from Herodotus. Cambyses marched with his army south against Ethiopia, and apparently without making proper arrangements for provisions, due to being so enraged at the disrespect the Ethiopian king had shown towards the Persians and Cambyses, while meeting with the spies that had been sent out. Not even halfway into the march south, the supplies ran out and troops resorted to eating the pack animals. Cambyses ordered the march to continue, and soon all the animals had been consumed, so the troops ate what they could find along the way. Once reaching the desert, the army resorted to cannibalism, and one out of every ten men were chosen to be the victim. Though once Cambyses had learned of what was taking place, he called the campaign off and returned with what was left of the army to Thebes and Egypt. The other campaign Cambyses had sent out was into Libya, though the force that left was never heard from again. Herodotus relays the story 
that he was told explaining the fate of the army. When the men had left Oasis, and in their march across the desert, had reached a point about midway between the town and Ammonian border, a southerly wind of extreme violence drove the sands over them in heaps as they were taking their midday meal, so that they disappeared forever. Many attempts in modern times have been made to try and find Cambyses' missing army, though many are convinced that the story Herodotus passes on is a myth, and the army was in fact defeated. But who knows, some stories that Herodotus relates that seem far-fetched have been vindicated or shown to have historical elements to them before. Even though both campaigns are presented as failures, it seems as though the Persians did have some control over parts of both Libya and Ethiopia after Cambyses' attempts. The picture that has been generally related in modern times about the image of Cambyses has come from Herodotus, which after the failed campaigns west and south is of a despotic ruler who had gone mad. Even in the stories Herodotus tells about Cambyses' failed campaigns, there is a hint of hubris with Cambyses stretching himself too far with his subsequent madness brought on by the gods as punishment. After his return from the Ethiopian campaign, we are told of a number of outrageous acts Cambyses commits against the Egyptians, which are all mainly religious in nature. He reportedly has the previous king Amasis's mummy disinterred and desecrated and finally burnt. Apparently many other tombs were opened up and the burials inside were abused and suffered similar fates. At a number of temples, the cult statues that were extremely important in Egyptian religion were openly mocked to the horror of the priests and Egyptians alike though the greatest outrage committed was of the slaying of the apis calf. The apis calf was a sacred animal who was seen as a manifestation of the king's qualities. The calf was also believed to be the son of the goddess Hathor, who was considered the symbolic mother of her earthly representations, such as the king. Upon Cambyses' return, he apparently encountered the Egyptians celebrating the birth of a new apis calf, with a festival in progress. Cambyses was convinced that the people were celebrating the disaster of his Ethiopian campaign and ordered that the animal be brought to him. Cambyses revealed a knife and slashed the animal, cutting its thigh, while laughing and taunting the priests on how they could worship a calf as a god. The calf was rushed off but later died and the priest conducted its burial ceremony in secret. Though there is much evidence in Egyptian documents and inscriptions that indicate Cambyses was administrating a smooth transition of power in Egypt. He was meant to have adopted Egyptian dress and customs while also leaving the current worship practices in place. This negative image that comes from Herodotus' histories seems to be based on who he spoke to in Egypt and the time period he spoke to them in. Most of the information that he gains about Egypt in his travels was from the priestly class, who had mixed feelings about their takeover by the Persians. Cambyses had removed tax exemptions from the temples throughout the lands, which would have affected their wealth. Also, the time Herodotus visited Egypt was during a period where revolts had been taking place, so presenting the Persians as oppressors would have helped their cause. It would seem that during the conquest, Cambyses was most likely acting in a pragmatic fashion to incorporate Egypt into the empire. Inevitably, there would have been parts of society that helped in this transition and parts that opposed it, depending on how it affected their livelihoods. What we are left with today with Herodotus' account is a selection of evidence that highlights certain parts of society, namely the priestly class's displeasure of Persian rule. While we also have administrative inscriptions that indicate a somewhat stable society after the conquest. Cambyses seems to have spent around three years in Egypt, from 525 to 522, before setting out to return to Susa in the heart of the empire. Apparently word of a revolt back in the empire had reached him, though he would never make it back, as he would die of an illness or a wound on his journey home. In this part of Persian history, things become really hazy with what was taking place back in the Persian court. Babylonian documents show that after Cambyses' death in April of 522, his younger brother, Badia, became king. Though it is also suggested that this king was an imposter and not Cambyses' brother at all. Badia only ruled for six months before the next king of Persia came to power and we have from a number of sources different explanations of what took place. These stories and what would be accepted would be extremely important to the legitimacy of the next king, Darius. All of these explanations, although varying in detail, seem to all show that a power vacuum was left back in the Persian court, showing that anyone with an eye on the throne could make a move for it. 
But then again, it may have just been a simple case of Cambyses dying on his journey back from Egypt, and his brother then becoming the new king of Persia. Though this simple explanation would cause problems for Darius, and his coming to power. Badia's rule would need to be spun in a different way, which would be the result of the stories we hear today. I will sum up what Herodotus says in his histories. Other Greek writers give accounts with the details varying a bit, but the outcome remains much the same. Cambyses' younger brother Badia, who Herodotus calls Smyrdas, had accompanied him on the Egyptian campaign. Though Cambyses had become extremely jealous of him and sent him back to Persia. Not long afterwards, Cambyses had a dream that his brother was sitting on the throne in Susa, which he took as an omen that his brother was plotting against him. He arranged for his most trusted friend to travel back to Susa to murder his brother before he could make a move against him, which was carried out. The murder was hidden from most, with only a handful of Persians aware of what had taken place. One of these Persians was Patazithes, who had been left in charge of administrating the empire while Cambyses was on campaign. Patazithes now planned a revolt against Cambyses. He happened to have an older brother who looked similar to Cambyses' younger brother, and also bore the same name. This Badia took the throne, presenting himself as the royal Badia, and sent proclamations throughout the empire informing of the new order. Cambyses prepared to travel back to Susa and oust the imposter, but was wounded in an accident before making it back. Before Cambyses died from his wound, he attempted to reveal to his men what had transpired, and that it was an imposter sitting on the throne and not his brother. Though the Persians thought Cambyses was trying to set the army on his brother, who was seen to have a claim to the throne, and disbelieved his story. Cambyses' most trusted friend also remained quiet after Cambyses' death, as he was fearful of his own fate, if it were known he had murdered a Persian royal. So we are told by Dia the imposter ruled the Persian Empire for the next seven months as part of a conspiracy with the Magi, Persian priestly class which he and his brother, Patazices, were a part of. So there the situation lay, had a pretender to the throne taken control, having seen an opportunity after the death of Cambyses' brother, or had indeed the real Badia taken control of his brother, and the Persian Empire still lay with a legitimate bloodline. After Badia's seven months of rule, another man would take control of the Persian Empire, and he would assure the Empire that the former was the case, and that he had returned the Empire back to its rightful line. At a place called Mount Bizetun, in the west of Iran, a large inscription was carved out in the rock face up in the mountains. One of the main roads in the Persian Empire, the Chorazin Highway, which connected the ancient cities of Babylon and Ekbakna, went right past the site so all those travelling past on foot, wagon or horseback, would be able to see what was represented there. The inscription was commissioned by the next king of Persia, Darius I, who wanted to present to the empire his version of events leading up to the coming of power. His message was inscribed in three different languages, being Old Persian, Elamite, and Babylonian, these being the most common languages used in the empire. The events surrounding Cambyses, his brother Badia, and Darius's accession are presented by many ancient writers in one form or another, but taken altogether, they create much confusion. We will focus mainly on what Darius himself was trying to present to his empire, and what Herodotus was telling his Greek audience in his histories. Herodotus gives us a tale of murder, conspiracy, and discovery of the truth by a small band of noble heroes, and the re-establishment of a legitimate rule to the empire once again. Darius, the son of Hystaspes, a Persian governor, was making his way to Susa with all haste. He had learnt somehow that the man who sat upon the throne was an imposter, and assuming he was the only one who had learnt the truth, was going to act against the usurper when he arrived. Little did Darius know that a small group of six conspirators had also learnt of the truth behind their king. A nobleman by the name of Ortanes had suspected the legitimacy of the current king and had someone on the inside he could turn to, to help him reveal the truth. His daughter had been one of the many wives of Cambyses, who Badia had inherited. Ortanes managed to convince his daughter the next time she was to spend the night with her husband, she should run her hands where her husband's ears would be, and if none were felt, the man was not her real husband, but an imposter. Ortanes knew that the magi he suspected of usurping the throne had had his ears cut off under Cyrus's rule as a punishment. His daughter was able to confirm her father's suspicions, which Ortanes shared with his two closest noble friends, who now sought to arrange a conspiracy against Badia. The three agreed to bring in an additional trusted accomplice, bringing the noble group of heroes to six. Once Darius arrived in Susa, 
He and the group had learnt of each other's knowledge of the imposter, and it was agreed to bring Darius into the group of the conspirators. Now ensured a debate on the best course of action, Ortanes was seeking the group to be cautious in their action, and not to act with too much haste. He wanted the group to recruit more supporters before making a move against Bidea. Darius, on the other hand, argued that there was no time to waste, and the action must take place at once. The more people they brought into the group, and the more time they let pass, greatly increased the chance that they would be betrayed. After much debate between Ortanes and Darius, support started to mount in Darius's favour, until all were in agreement with taking the action Darius proposed. A gathering at the palace had been arranged by the Magi. They had taken measures to attempt to secure their secret even more. The one other man who also knew the truth was Cambyses' most trusted friend, Pazapses, who had murdered the real Bardia. The Magi, wanting to ensure he would not reveal the truth, took him into their confidence and bribed him with riches. Pazapses agreed to also make an announcement to the people gathered at the palace wall, dispelling any rumours around the murder of Cambyses' brother. It was believed his word would satisfy the people, as he was held in great regard in Persian society. Prasapses gave his speech to the Persians. He began by tracing Cyrus' genealogy and described the great deeds he had done for his country. This then set up what he was to end his speech with. He ignored what the Magi had wished him to say. He had dispensed with the fears of his own safety he used to hold and now revealed the truth of his involvement in Cambyses' brother's murder and the plot of the Magi. Prasapses urged the Persians that the throne needed to be returned to the Achaemenid line. Cyrus's genealogy. With that, he threw himself to his death from the tower he had given his speech from. Darius and his co-conspirators, who were on their way to the palace, received word of what had taken place. With this new development, Ortanes once again urged that they should hold off from acting right away, though Darius's argument won out again. The seven were led into the palace by the guards due to the rank they held in Persian society but were challenged by the palace eunuchs when entering the hall. The conspirators now had to act decisively. They took out their daggers and stabbed the eunuchs blocking their way. The Magi were alerted to the commotion nearby, and seeing what was taking place, they prepared to defend themselves. A close quarters fight ensured, with two of the conspirators being wounded, though eventually the Magi were overpowered and killed. Word of the Magi plot and the exploits of the seven noble heroes spread. For the next few days, anyone of the priestly class wasn't safe, and would be cut down if discovered by the people. Once the excitement had died down after a few days, Herodotus has the seven conspirators meeting to discuss the future of the empire, and what sort of system should administer it. Three systems are raised, democracy, oligarchy, and monarchy, with three of the conspirators each arguing their case for their preferred system. Darius had argued for monarchy, and the other four of their group ended up siding with the case that Darius put forward. The group now sought a way to decide which of them would become king of the empire. What would take place was all seven of the men would meet on horseback outside the city at daybreak, and whoever's horse neighed first, once the sun had risen, would take the throne. Darius and his stable hand arranged a trick that would see that he would be guaranteed of his horse being the first to neigh. During the night his stable hand fetched a mare that Darius's horse was extremely fond of, and tied her up in the spot where the men would meet. He then took Darius's horse and led him around her closer and closer before allowing him to mount the mare. That morning, the seven approached the agreed location. As Darius reached the location on his horse where it had had its late night rendezvous, it started forward and let out a neigh. Although the sun had not yet risen, a flash of lightning immediately occurred, along with a loud clap of thunder. The rest of the conspirators took this to be proof of Darius's divine right to the throne. This is what Herodotus presented to his audience as what he had been told in regards to Darius's rise to the throne. I've only really given a summary of the story, but if you take time to read what he wrote himself, you will see even more juicy details that the Greeks love to hear about. As I said earlier, Mount Bicetun contained the inscription outlining what also took place over this time. The term history is written by the victor is on full display here. Darius wanted all who passed by the rock face to see his account of his rise to power. Darius' summary of events has Cambyses ordering the death of his brother in secret just before the Egyptian campaign began. When talking about Cambyses' own death, all that is related is that he died his own death, which from how this is written in the three different scripts implies that he wasn't murdered. After Cambyses' death in 522, Badir rebelled, who Darius claimed was the imposter. 
To make things a little more confusing, Bardia, who Herodotus calls Smyrdas, Darius calls Gumata, though we'll stick to using Bardia to keep things simple. Not only do the inscriptions tell of Bardia rebelling, but it also has other regions of the empire rising up in revolt under other leaders. This gives an impression that after Cambyses' death, a level of instability existed, as no clear successor was in line for the throne. Darius also makes sure he points out the chaos the empire fell into, with Bardia ruling, and his murderous ways with anyone who knew his true identity. Much of the inscription outlines the battles that were fought throughout the empire by Darius and his supporters, of whom six are named in the inscription. It appears that Bardia had retreated to a fortress in Medea, and where he was defeated and killed. As well as the inscription, there is also a relief showing Darius standing with his foot on top of Bardia, the imposter. And then before him are nine men in chains who represent the nine self-proclaimed kings who rebelled in different parts of the empire. Above the scene is a sun disk representing the god Ahura Mazda from the Persian religion of Zoroastrian. Within the inscription, Darius invokes Ahura Mazda many times and uses the dualism that is integral to the Zoroastrian ideology. For example, he talks of chaos when referring to Baidea's rule, but then talks of order when of himself. Also, the notion of the lie and the truth are at work, with the lie at work, with Baidea coming to the throne, but Darius is armed with the truth. So as we can see, many of the details differ in the accounts, but for the most part, they both get to the point that Darius saved the Persian Empire in a crisis by removing an illegitimate ruler and making things right by taking the throne as the empire's rightful ruler. Though one can still not help ask how legitimate was Darius himself, and was Bardia who sat on the throne as imposter, or was he really the son of Cyrus? Although the events behind this whole episode of Persian history are very hazy, the Persian Empire was now ruled by Darius I. Although now king, Darius still had a couple of rebellious governors to deal with. In Lydia, the governor had stayed on the sideline during the rebellions of the succession crisis, and had murdered one of Darius's messengers when he was gathering support. Now that Darius has succeeded, he sent another messenger to test where the loyalty of the men around the governor of Lydia lay. A series of orders, one by one, were read out to the guards to carry out. Once it was seen that the loyalty of the men around the governor lay with Darius, the final order was read out, which was to kill the governor, which was carried out right away. Another region that had to be dealt with was that of the newly acquired Egypt. The governor there, put in place by Cambyses, had started minting coins with his own image. This was seen a challenge to Darius's rule, so the order went out for him to be eliminated also. With the empire now firmly under Darius's control, he now sought to further expand the Persian boundaries. He was able to add the Indus Valley where modern day Pakistan and part of India are today. In North Africa, he was able to expand into Libya, up to where modern day Benghazi is now. A campaign was also undertaken against the Scythians, who Cyrus had died fighting. The campaigning was around the Danube and the Black Sea regions, which Herodotus reports as being a failure, though Darius's goals of the campaign are unclear. The Persian campaign had taken place much closer to Greece, and during the Scythian campaign, we hear of a contingent of Greeks led by a man named Miltiades. They participated on the side of the Persians by defending the bridge over the Danube that they had constructed. We will hear more about Miltiades in a few episodes' time, as he will be instrumental in the defence of Greece. Even closer to Greece was the region of Thrace, just north and to the east. It was another region that would come under Persian control. Parts would remain so even after the Greek second defeat of the Persian invasion in 479 BC. Persian campaigning in Thrace brought Greece and Persian interests into closer contact. The regions in Thrace, which included modern-day northern Greece, the European part of Turkey, and parts of Bulgaria, were rich in timber and various metals. Many of the populations in Thrace that had been subjugated would have previously been trading with the Greek city-states, but now trade was somewhat reduced, with resources now making their way back to the Persian Empire. Persian influence was now directly up to the northern border of where the lands were considered Greek. This would heighten the level of unease in the Greek city-states, but also present opportunities to individuals such as Hippias exiled in Athens, and to political factions seeking support over rivals. As we have seen over the last two episodes, the Persian Empire sprang up and took the Near Eastern world by storm. Cyrus had emerged and created an empire larger than anything that had come before it, and all in his lifetime. His son Cambyses then stepped onto the world stage after his death, 
and further expanded the boundaries. Then crisis hit the empire, with murder and conspiracy threatening to destabilise and fragment the empire, before a new ruler would rise to suppress rebellion and prevent Persia falling into disarray. A thick blanket of confusion and uncertainty fell over the events of this period. The entertaining stories of Herodotus and other Greek writers, coupled with the new king's inscriptions, providing a possible account. This man, a far distant relative of Cyrus, was at pains to show the empire his legitimacy through his accounts of events and his presented genealogy. The Persian Empire would survive the crisis and its new king would further expand the empire in nearly all directions of the compass, bringing the interests of the empire and the Greek world in contact with one another. This now brings the development of the Persian Empire roughly up to where we left the Spartans and Athenians in the episodes that we focused on them. Next episode we will jump back into the narrative of the period where we will see the beginnings of what would turn out to be the Greek and Persian Wars. The Persian Empire at this point, around 500 BC, was the largest the world had yet seen and at its greatest extent. Ruled by Darius I, he was the fourth king of the Achaemenid dynasty since the empire first emerged under Cyrus the Great in 550 BC. The empire was now made up of around 20 provinces known as satrapies, each with its own capital and satrap or governor at its head acting on behalf of the king. There were five main administrative capitals essential to running of the empire. Pasargade was the earliest capital to be set up under Cyrus and where his tomb is now located. Amongst the many palaces and halls, we hear of extensive walled gardens being established, which the Greeks called Paradisus, where we get our word paradise from. Under Darius, the capital was moved 40 kilometres south to Persepolis, which would take up the centre point of the empire's administration. Susa, with closer access to the west, started to take some share in political power under Cambyses, and under Darius, major building programs were underway. It would become a capital that the royal court would relocate to during the oppressive summer experienced at Persepolis. Another capital set up as a summer residence for the royal court was that of Ecbatna, which was the old capital of the Medes. Babylon also became an important administrative centre for the empire, while also being the centre of learning in the Persian Empire. All of the satrapies were connected through the empire by a network of roads that allowed messengers and troops to reach all corners of the empire. The most famous description of the roads comes from Herodotus. He talks about the stretch that connected Sardis, the capital of the Lydian satrapy, to Susa. From the Greek perspective, Susa was the centre of the Persian Empire, as it was the closest royal capital for them to travel to, while Sardis was the closest major city upon reaching the Ionian coastline. The royal road was reserved for royal business only, with anyone travelling along it requiring documentation to receive provisions along the way. Equally as famous as the royal road was the royal messenger service that operated along it. Dotted along the road were way stations where fresh horses and riders would be stationed. As a messenger arrived at one of these stations, the message would be passed on to the next rider who would continue the journey right away. This allowed the messengers to travel to their destination faster than any other means. To finish off today's episode, I'm going to leave you with how Herodotus describes these royal messengers. Those of you from America may recognise what he has to say, as it is almost identical to the unofficial motto of one of your institutions. No mortal thing travels faster than these Persian couriers. Nothing stops these couriers from covering their allotted stage in the quickest possible time. Neither snow, rain, heat, nor darkness. Thank you for your continued support. To receive updates and to be notified of new episodes, you can subscribe at castingthroughancientgreece.com. Also, you can follow the series on Facebook at Casting Through Ancient Greece or on Twitter at Casting Greece. I hope you can join me next time for episode 14, The Ionian Revolt.